for the worship ministry in the temple were decided. And if you've ever wanted to hear what a Hebrew name sounds like spoken in a southern accent, well, now you have it. Your curiosity has been satisfied. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing on our thoughts tonight. Father, thank you for your word. And we pray tonight, Lord, that you would bless us, that you would give us insight. We thank you for this wonderful ministry that you've given us. And we pray that we would be faithful. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. First Chronicles chapter 25 is a list of Levites. It's just a list of people, but what makes the names on this list so important is the ministry to which they were devoted. These were the people that God appointed to direct the music ministry of the temple worship. In the preface of certain psalms, David calls them the chief musicians. As you know, all believers are called to worship God. But a chosen few have been given the awesome privilege and responsibility of leading in the worship. To me, the fact that God documents in the pages of Scripture the names of the ancient temple's worship leaders proves just how much He loves and values all worship leaders. Leading worship is no trivial post. I'm not suggesting that the roster of sign-ups for this conference is as important as the biblical list, But the list of worship leaders here this weekend is also vital to God. Rest assured, the Lord loves His chief musicians. In heaven, the angels are in the midst of the worship. Mighty seraphim and cherubim are the creatures God has placed in charge of heaven's worship ministry. These creatures minister in perpetual motion. Their voices never tire Their bodies never sleep. They're on constant duty, bathing God's throne with praise. Yet here on earth, God has placed you at the center of His worship. I'm sure that He could have sent experienced angels to do the job. But you see, you have a perspective that the angels lack. Yes, when you do multiple services on the same Sunday, your voice starts to fade and crack. Perhaps it's a stretch to sing the harmonies you've been asked to sing. Maybe you're still not that good at memorizing lyrics, but God takes it all in stride, for He still considers you preferable to the angels because you, not them, have tasted of His glorious grace. Redeemed human beings of all His creatures should be appreciative of God's manifold mercies. Even more so than the angels, we're the ones that should be on the edge of our seats, ready to worship at the drop of a hat. Don't underestimate the honor, my friend, but God has chosen you to be a lead worshiper. Though the temple had 24 regiments of worship leaders, the 24 divisions were directed by three men, Juduthan, Asaph, and Heman. And I'm sure God chose these men for their skill and their godliness. They had a heart for worship, and they were blessed with musical talent, no doubt. But God's choice may have also had something to do with the meaning of their names. These three names refer to three qualities essential for all faithful worship leaders. The name Heman means faithful. And of course, the first requirement for all worship leaders is faithfulness. Are you on time? Do you practice? Are you a worshiper at home in your private time or only in front of people? Is your motive to minister to God and His people or just to show off your skill and your talent? In short, are you a faithful worship leader? If you're a worship leader at your church, God has made you a steward an overseer of a vital ministry. And you remember 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, one trait is expected of all stewards. It's not an extraordinary set of vocal cords or Eric Clapton quality guitar skills. No, the one prerequisite for anyone in ministry is faithfulness. Well, the second name, Asaph, means gatherer. And I've discovered that a good worship leader has got to be a gatherer. 
Now I can hear you ask, gatherer of what? Well, for starters, what about a gatherer of worship songs? To keep the music of your church fresh and relevant, you need new songs. Throughout the book of Psalms, we're told to sing a new song unto the Lord. We'll be teaching a few new songs here this weekend. But a worship leader has to gather other items as well. For one, what about equipment? Why is it most worship leaders that I've known believe the answer to every problem is a new piece of equipment? (laughs) That kind of attitude can wreck a church budget. Yet I have to admit that there are times when upgrades are helpful and a good worship leader shops around and gets it at a bargain. He's a gatherer of equipment. A worship leader also gathers instruments to add to the team. A saxophone or a ukulele or a banjo or a juice harp. My oh my, all these things can be welcome changes to the same old, same old. You also need to be a gatherer of fresh ideas and helpful suggestions and biblical perspectives. And hopefully we'll gather all the above this week. And a worship leader also seeks to gather a stable of talented and sincere musicians to make music and to sing God's praise. A good worship leader is always recruiting. He delights in seeing new believers use their gifts for God and discover what it was they were created to do. He wants to gather fresh blood and add it to the mix. I'll never forget a brother in our church who came to us from a non-instrumental church of Christ. As a matter of fact, he's here again tonight. Randy, good to see you. Randy was a pastor in a non-instrumental church of Christ. But Randy is a talented guitarist and an incredible songwriter. And yet his denomination had kept him from playing his instrument in church. He was stifled. I remember Randy, it was like a fish lying on the dock. Sorry about that, Randy. But he was just like a fish that had been plucked from the water. It was just laying on the dry dock, drying up, withering, about to die. Well, Suddenly at Calvary Chapel, it was as if God put that fish back into the water. He was wiggling and swimming and splashing again. He was alive again. He had found his intended purpose. It was so liberating to watch. And this is the joy that lead worshipers experience over and over and over again when they recruit a musician who finally finds the purpose for their gift. Be a gatherer of people. Well, Heman means faithful. Asaph means gatherer. And the name of the third captain in this list of worship leaders, Juduthan, means, and here I need a little drum roll. You won't believe this, but I got this from the renowned Hebrew scholars, Kiel and Delish. Dead Germans are backing me up on this. Juduthan means Praise man. And I can hear him be introduced at the Davidic worship conference faster than a speeding drummer who just drank his second Red Bull, more powerful than a lead guitar player who's gone deaf, able to leap over a stage full of microphone cords in a single bound. It's a bird. Well, he is a little flighty. It's a plane. No, nothing boring about a worship leader. Hey, it's praise man. Jaduthan wore a big P on his chest. And imagine the possibilities. Imagine the TV TV possibilities this would have spawned. He probably starred in a weekly episode of The Adventures of Praise Man. Each Sunday morning, watch Praise Man Fight the evil villains of worship ministry. Tardy boy. Can't make it to practice man. Captain won't work with others. And the vilest villain of all, Mr. Never in Tune. God wants every worship leader to be a praise man. 
Friends, he wants your heart to be bubbling up and overflowing with praise to him and love for his people. God wants you to possess a vision for your church's worship. He wants you to be so determined to usher your people into God's presence that you're willing to fight the villains week after week and never give up. I know there are times when it takes a superhero's effort, but God will empower you. The Holy Spirit is your superpower. Every church needs a praise man. (laughs) And in this chapter, we find out what that takes. Earlier in this section, 1 Chronicles chapters 23, verse 5, we're told, 4,000 Levites praised the Lord with musical instruments, which I made, said David, for giving praise. King David was a crafter of musical instruments. He was a musician who loved to make music and make new instruments that would make music. David was always looking for new ways to praise his great God. And let me ask you, I need to cut right to the chase tonight. When you pick up your instrument, that bass or those drumsticks, or when you sit at your keyboard, when you pull that precious guitar out of its padded case, and some of those cases are more plush than the casket that one day will hold its owner's remains, Oh, how we love our instruments. But when you pick up yours, what do you see? A ticket to stardom? A toy you use for fun? A way to jam with your friends? Or to impress the girls? God has a far higher purpose for that instrument. First Chronicles tells us your instrument was designed and you were chosen to play it for two reasons. For giving praise, and as chapter 25 verse 1 says, to prophesy for God. Music was created to declare God's worth and God's word. To speak to and for and about God. Thus a person who squanders their superpowers on trivial pursuits is a villain, not a hero. That's why to be a real praise man or a real praise woman, the first step is to see your instrument as a stewardship from God. Have you surrendered your music to the will of God? Well, there's another key to being a praise man. Note the men discussing, we're discussing were leaders under a leader. Notice verse 6. Asaph, Jeduthun, and Heman were under the authority of the king. Temple players weren't maverick musicians. There was a chain of command. The musical Levites were under these three chief musicians who were under David, who was under God. And this should be the order in your worship ministry. Jesus is king. The senior pastor is under Jesus. The worship leader is under the senior pastor then all of the players and singers are under him. Make no mistake about it, the king who should direct all of our worship is King Jesus. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 12 is a great verse. It reveals a wonderful truth about the current habits of our risen Lord Jesus. God the Son says to God the Father, In the midst of the congregation, I will sing praise to you. Did you know that Jesus slips into our services? That he joins our congregation and he sings the praises of God with us? And if Jesus is in the house actively worshiping, isn't it best that we let him lead? I think so. We would do well to look to Jesus to inspire and to instruct and to direct our worship. But having acknowledged that Jesus is king of kings and needs to be the ultimate worship leader, let's also accept that there was an earthly king to whom these three chief musicians answered. His name was David. The temple musicians were under the chief musicians who were under David who was under God. And let me explain what this ultimately means in our church. I believe it's a biblical pattern for all churches. The senior pastor 
is the senior worship leader. But you say, Pastor Sandy, I've heard you try. You can't sing. When you sing, the dogs gather by the screen door. I mean, people call the police and file reports when you sing. And though that's true, as the pastor, God is still faithful to give me a vision for the worship ministry of our church. I get the big picture. How the Sunday message and the music and the movements of the service fit together. Surely I get other people's input. And then I ask skilled musicians like our team to carry it all out. But God entrusts me with the big picture. And I think it holds back what God wants to do in our churches if we don't view our senior pastor as the senior worship leader. Hey, if he wants you to do five songs rather than usual six, don't buck him. If he tells you to turn down your guitar, don't argue. If he says that you went too long on a song, don't bristle up and get defensive. If he asks you to teach a new song, even suggest what that new song might be, even if you hate it, trust in his judgment. Take the attitude, my pastor knows best. If you learn submission to authority, God will work through your pastor to bless your church and he'll make you a better worship leader in the process. Reminds me of the conflict that occurred in the church between the pastor and the worship leader. Oh, it was terrible. Eventually, the animosity spilled over into the services. One week, the pastor preached on commitment to Christ, how we need to follow Jesus. But the worship leader sabotaged his sermon when he played, I shall not be moved. (laughs) Well, the next week, the pastor preached on tithing. And that's when the worship guy sang, Jesus paid it all. Well, the third week, the pastor spoke on gossip. This time the worship leader closed the service with, I love to tell the story. This so infuriated the worship leader, or so infuriated the pastor that he told the congregation that he was considering resigning, turning in his resignation. That's when the worship leader struck up the hymn, Oh, why not tonight? Finally, the following Sunday, the pastor, he made it official. He announced that Jesus had told him that it was time to move on. And that's when the worship leader played the hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Well, the point of the story is that when a riff occurs between the worship leader and the pastor, everyone suffers and the cause of Christ gets hindered. If you hear nothing else I say tonight, hear this. Let your pastor lead and you follow. But here's another point from chapter 25 that marks a praise man. In verses 1 and 6, the music played in the temple is referred to not as performance, but as service or ministry. We're told they were performing their service, not serving to perform. Back in 1 Chronicles chapter 6, verses 31 and 32, the core of worship leaders is also mentioned. And here's how they're introduced. These are the men whom David appointed over the service of song in the house of the Lord. They were ministering with music, and they served in their office according to their order. Note the emphasis here, and never forget it. The scripture calls the temple worship the service of song. Christian musicians come in two varieties, servants and performers. And it's easy to distinguish the difference. To the performers, the people exist for them. It's all about their music. But to the servants, they exist for the people. It's God's music. A true servant is focused on the glory of God and the good of the people. Tell a real praise man when he's able to alter his musical style a bit. So that he can better minister to people and and comply with someone's wishes. You can tell a real praise man because he's checked his ego at the door. But tell a performer to alter his style or his taste and he'll raise the roof. He'll pitch a fit. You see, his ego is involved. He'll get pitchy all right and in the worst way. 
You know, it's sad, but I've known guys who were the most generous and gracious and giving and godly men until it came to their music. Just tamper with their tune. Just tinker with their talent. And it's as if you're defiling holy ground. They get weirded out over their music. Once a guitar player, he had his amp blaring as he was grinding on a rock and roll favorite. A neighbor in the apartment next to his stuck his head in the door and shouted, Do you know there's a sick little old lady upstairs? The guy put down his guitar and he scratched his head and he said, I'm not sure, would you hum a few bars? It's amazing how music can be such a blind spot to people. You're oblivious to what everyone else sees as obvious. You don't realize how selfish you are until it's too late. Reminds me of the first episodes of the TV show American Idol where the judges weed out all the wannabes. You know, folks who can't carry a tune suddenly come out of the woodwork thinking that they can compete on a national stage. This kind of thing doesn't happen in sports. You don't have players come out for a Major League Baseball tryout who can't hit or pitch or field or throw. Yet when American Idol comes to town for the audition, every tone-deaf, nasally-pitched crooner steps up to the plate. Hey, everybody sounds good in the shower and in the car. Did you know that? The two places you sound good, the shower and the car. But that doesn't mean that you're going to sound good on a national stage. The awful sounding people so easily develop the impression that they can sing. To me is undeniable proof that everyone's musical ego is prone to some serious blind spots. Ezekiel 28 seems to imply that before his rebellion, Lucifer was once the worship leader in heaven. Ezekiel 28 verse 13 depicts the former archangel as a musical creature. We're told the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. Perhaps this is why even today the devil is so successful in weaving his blasphemies and his heresies into pop music. Music is powerful and Satan is skillful. Remember though how Satan lost his job. As heaven's worship leader, he got tired of standing in the shadows, deflecting the applause. After all, this was his music. Why shouldn't he have at least a little creative control? Why not he take a little bit of the credit? Pride entered Lucifer's heart. His musical ego became his downfall. And perhaps this is why worship leaders are one of Satan's favorite targets. If Lucifer can no longer lead worship, he doesn't want you to enjoy the job. Martin Luther once said, when Satan wants to get into a church, he joins the choir. I think the same could be said for the worship team. Ephesians 4 verse 27 tells us, don't give the devil a foothold. We need to guard our hearts against pride and selfishness. Worship is first and foremost service. Not an opportunity for you to perform. Notice too from our text, a praise man isn't afraid of hard work. In chapter 25 verse 1, these leaders are called skilled men, which can be translated workmen. It's a blue collar term. They worked by the sweat of their brow. Apparently a praise man is skilled, but he also works hard at his ministry. He labors to get along with other musicians. He toils to learn new songs. He practices his music to improve his skills and his voice. You know, it's interesting the word liturgy, a synonym for worship in many churches, literally means the common work. And it takes work and effort on the part of all the church's worship leaders to maintain an atmosphere of harmony and excellence and expectancy. It's been said, Too many Christians today worship their work, work at their play, and play at their worship. A good worship leader works at his worship. He'll do what's needed to improve the quality of the church's music ministry. And there's always room to improve. 
Good worship leaders are always growing. When our church first started, we had a terrible time finding a worship leader. One Sunday, I became so desperate that I set up a record player, a record player, in the altar of the church. And we tried to sing that morning to the Praise Strings albums. Horrible is not a strong enough word. (laughs) That next week, I sort of blackmailed God. My prayer was this, Lord, until you provide us someone to lead worship, I'm going to lead a cappella. And I was determined. And, And again, I'm terribly terrible. Well, after the very first week, just took one week, a young man approached me and said, Pastor Sandy, I don't know anything about worship, but I can play a guitar and I can sing a little bit. And so if you'll get me some chords and some lyrics, I know I can do a better job than I heard this morning. (laughs) And over the next 12 years, Pastor James worked really hard at his musical abilities. He even took voice lessons at one point. And he grew into a wonderful praise man, but he worked at it. He's now been my assistant pastor for 38 years. But the point is, don't be too proud to do what it takes to improve your skills. The glory of God and the people of God deserve your willingness to work hard. It's noted in verse 7 here, the temple worship leaders were said to be skillful. A praise man needs to have a combination of both heart and and art, and both get better with attention. Don't just rely on what God's given. God wants you to take what He's given and work hard at it. Then another point to glean about a praise man is found in verses 5 and 6. For God gave Heman 14 sons and daughters. All these were under the direction of their father for the music in the house of the Lord. Heman was a fruitful worship leader. God gave him 14 little worship leaders to teach and to direct. I realize in Heman's case, Mrs. Heman had a little something to do with this large brood. But spiritually speaking, every anointed worship leader should be siring offspring. Little worship leaders should be running around, growing under your tutelage. Even in worship, the goal is to multiply ministry. Whenever we serve the Lord, the point is not just to serve, but to multiply ourselves as we do, to teach and train others and share the ministry with them. Rather than build a personal following, an anointed worship leader equips other leaders to take his place. It's sad when a worship leader gets territorial. In chapter 25, David had three worship leaders And apparently, they all worked together. They all got along. A true praise man enjoys seeing his protégés get an opportunity to. Let's also notice another thought from verse 6. In 1 Chronicles 25, it addresses one type of worship, the temple worship. It speaks of the Levites who served in the ministry of worship in the house of the Lord. And this is important for how we worship has a lot to do with where we're at, with the time and the place. Understand, temple worship was not the only kind of worship in Israel at the time. People worshiped God in their homes and in fields and wherever folks who loved God met and congregated. As a shepherd, David had worshipped God while tending his father's flocks. He had written many of the Psalms out under the stars. But there was a distinction between temple worship and personal worship. One was public, one was private. And this distinction is also seen in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 2, verse 46, we're told that the believers were continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. There was a formal public worship that was open to everyone. This went on in the temple, and there was a more informal, private worship involving only believers that occurred in homes. You know, in Paul's discussion on the use of tongues in 1 Corinthians 14, 
this distinction occurs again. In fact, Paul adds a third venue for worship, his own personal devotions. It's impossible to understand 1 Corinthians 14 without realizing there are three worship environments that existed in the early church. First, there was the open meeting. Second, there was the believer's meeting. And then third, there was a person's personal devotions. And thus, when it came to the gift of tongues, Paul explains, in private moments, by himself, he enjoyed a free-flowing experience with God. I speak with tongues more than you all, Paul said. That was between Paul and God. He then mentions believers coming together to share in small groups. These individuals knew each other. Each person came with a psalm, a teaching, a tongue. Tongues were allowed, but with some order and with some parameters. Paul instructed them, let there be two or at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. Then, of course, there was the public assembly where unbelievers were likely to walk in and check out the conduct of the Christians. And here's where Paul discouraged the use of tongues altogether. He says, in the church... I would rather speak five words with understanding than 10,000 words in a tongue. Here's my point. The environment, the makeup, and the purpose of the meeting helped to dictate what was appropriate and inappropriate in the worship. There are certain demonstrations of worship, like the praise of God in an unknown tongue, that are best appreciated and beneficial in small groups attended by informed believers who understand the issues in play. Yet if those same manifestations occurred in the public assembly, it could cause harm and create confusion. Whenever we discuss worship ministry, it's vital to remember the distinction between public and private worship. Expressions that are totally appropriate in our private times with the Lord may be out of bounds in the public assembly. My point is, is that the venue plays a role in determining what is fitting and edifying in our worship. I'll never forget the lady who attended our church who insisted on standing in the chair that she was sitting in in order to worship. It's funny to think about it now, but she was serious. I'm not sure if she thought she could see better or whether she thought she was closer to heaven by standing up in her chair. But when we told her to sit down, she accused us of violating her liberty. She never thought about the poor people behind her. I won't draw too vivid of a picture here, but can you imagine what they had to look at the whole time? While she was standing in her chair. We've had ladies in our church who wiggled while they worshiped. They turned Sunday mornings into a Zumba section. We've had to ask them to settle down. If you want to wiggle at home between you and God, you're free to do so. But in the church's small groups and public assembly, there are other concerns. In the larger venue, you can be a distraction. There are postures and expressions of worship that are not appropriate for the public assembly because they take the focus off of the God who's being worshipped and they put it on the worshiper in all of our worship. We want our focus to be on Jesus alone. Think of it in the context of a marriage. There's the bedroom, there's the living room, and there's the grocery store. There are expressions of love and intimacy between a husband and a wife that are entirely appropriate in the privacy of a bedroom. Obviously, in the living room, when guests are over, those expressions get tempered a little bit. And at the grocery store, greater restrictions are imposed. But what if a husband and wife tried to practice some of their bedroom behavior in the aisle at the grocery store? Whoa, Nelly! They'd be thrown into jail. And likewise, there are expressions of worship perfectly appropriate in the secret place that get you thrown out of the assembly, at least they do here, and deservedly so. Public worship involves decorum. There is a place for extravagant worship, but there's also a place for considerate worship. We need to teach folks the difference. It's part of loving each other. And then I want you to look again in 1 Chronicles 25 verse 8. It says, 
and they cast lots for their duty. The small as well as the great, the teacher with the student. Notice a few points here. First, there, was, there were more than enough worship leaders to meet the needs of the temple service, so they conducted a lottery to determine the shifts and the rotations. With an overabundance of worship leaders, I'm sure worship ministry was no longer seen as a duty to begrudge, but as a privilege to be appreciated and anticipated. I remember when our church finally gathered enough worship leaders for two teams. It changed the whole dynamic. People no longer viewed their service as a duty, but now as an opportunity. When their week rolled around, they didn't want to miss their turn. Our musicians and our singers wanted to serve more rather than less. Your church may not have a stable of qualified leaders. You may be the worship team. But keep the right perspective. Leading worship should always be a privilege. And never think you can't be replaced. If God desires, He can raise up another you in a heartbeat. If you think you're indispensable to your church, stick your finger in a glass of water and then pull it out quickly. The time it takes for that hole to disappear is the time it'll take for God to replace you. Over the years, I've learned no one is irreplaceable, including me. All of us need to be thankful for the mere opportunity to serve. Here's another thought from verse 8. When they cast the lots to decide the worship rotations, they were expressing their dependence upon the Lord. Proverbs 16 verse 33 explains the use of the ancient lotteries. They lot, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. The worship rotations were decided not by talent. It says small and great went into the lottery. And not by experience, for the teacher and the student were represented. It was God that dictated the rotations. Not talent, not experience. And our worship ministries also need to be led by God. Of course, today we no longer rely on casting lots. We seek our guidance through the Holy Spirit. The Hebrews believed, though, that God controlled the roll of the dice. Today, it's through His Spirit that God controls how we roll. We need to be Spirit-led in our decisions regarding worship. Well, let me close where we started. Verse 1. Moreover, David and the captains of the army separated for the service some of the sons. Again, before musical ability is even mentioned, we're told they were called to serve. Service was their priority. A worship leader should never forget that we are called to the service of song. Reminds me of the man who died and he went to heaven. When he arrived, he decided to visit Heaven's Museum. But when he got there, he was dis surprised at the displays. There was nothing there from the era of Alexander the Great or from the age of Napoleon. There was no Pope's ring or King's scepter or President's pen. All he saw in Heaven's Museum was a widow's mite, the feather of a little bird, and several bottles of tears. He also saw some swaddling clothes, a carpenter's cup, and a sponge that had once been dipped in vinegar, as well as a hammer and three nails. Well, the man finally asked the museum curator, he says, have you got a towel and a bowl in your collection? He answered, no, they're not here. They remain in constant use. God has retired his hammer and nails. The sacrifice of Jesus was once and for all. But the bowl and the towel, friends, are still meant to be used. If you want to be a true praise man, a true praise woman, be a servant first. I'm sure your worship team has all kinds of vital equipment. Your guitars and your piano and your bass, even a soundboard and speakers and microphones, no doubt. But do you have a bowl and a towel? These are our most important instruments. God wants us to be servants first, musicians second. 
before you plug in your pickup or crank up your amp or sound check your microphone, you need to pick up a bowl and a towel and have the attitude of a servant. Bobby Bowden was a famous football coach at Florida State, but in college, Bobby played baseball. And he had never hit a home run until one game he yanked a ball down the right field foul line. As it sailed over the fence, he couldn't believe him. He finally hit a home run. It felt so good to break into his home run trot. But as soon as Bobby's foot hit home plate, the pitcher grabbed the ball and appealed to first base. The umpire screamed, out! In Bobby Bowden's trip around the bases, he got so excited, he failed to touch first base. And here's a good word to worship leaders. Don't forget first base. So what if you've got the coolest sounds and the tightest rhythms and the sweetest harmonies? So what if you hit a home run every Sunday morning only to find out later you never took care of first base? It'll be bum a bummer to be called out by God for failing to serve. The most pleasant chords turn into discord without the right attitude. Over time, the most God-glorifying worship comes from a team of servants. As worship leaders, let's remember God loves His chief musicians. You've been called to a strategic ministry. Be faithful. Be a gatherer. Be filled with praise. Be under authority. Work hard. Be a blue-collar worship leader. Multiply ministry and involve others. Be appropriate in your worship and teach others why. Recall the privilege it all is. Be led by God's Spirit. And above all, don't miss first base. Be a servant. It's a bird. It's a plane. Go get them, praise man. <laughs>